It's my pleasure right now uh, uh, to welcome uh, Peter Cristiano, uh, 2011, I believe it was, who uh, don't know right here for Eastern region. Uh, I had the chance to, to visit his wood lot. Uh, please, if you have some time, please chat with him and go his, and see his uh, beautiful, beautiful property. Uh, I think I was one of the luckiest to hug your big tree uh, <laughs> on that particular day. I will never forget uh, that day. Three of us trying to hug one single tree and we couldn't fit uh, uh, you know, hug it. It was so huge, yeah. So it's my pleasure to welcome you, Peter, to, to give a presentation to this wonderful group. described as an upland mixed wood forest. Uh, the soils are a rich soil, dry moist to moist. Uh, throughout this stand or on, in the property there were probably four different stands or cover types. Uh, one would have been old field white spruce. The second one would have been uh, balsam fir mature. Uh, third stand type would have been uh, mixed wood um, so quite common that you'd see around uh, white spruce, balsam fir, a little bit of red maple. And then the fourth stand types were um, uh, tolerant hardwoods. So I'm going to go through and just give a brief description of what type of management we did on, on each particular site. Uh, this right here is the um, old field white spruce. You can see in 1973 to 75, we went in and did what you refer to as a marshable thinning. We probably removed about 30% of the basal area on the first entry, and you can see about three or four years after we did that, you all of a sudden got this incredible acceleration in, in growth, and, and this was even on 35, 40 year old white spruce. It still had the capacity uh, to release. In 1999, we entered again and removed the next third of the, of the stand. Uh, I've got a picture here. In some, we have a few areas where we haven't done the final uh, cut, which we're, we're doing right now. As you can see, as we slowly opened the stand up, we got regeneration of yellow birch and sugar maple, mostly. Um, the opening was, was gradual over 25 years, so the trees have very good form, nice and straight, good and healthy trees. That's another part there. You can see the last of the overstory that we're going to be removing probably this year. These are some of the areas where we've done the final removal of, of, the, of the white spruce. And again, you can see there's some, some very fine quality hardwoods growing in there. Here's a, this is sort of the crowning glory um, that we got, and that, that's a stand of sugar maple. And I mean, it's just, uh, well, it, 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 it's a beautiful thing. Um, so we'll be in there, we'll be doing some, starting some crop tree release, uh, things like that. Just, uh, that's another area where it's been done. You can see what we did. We probably could have tightened up 
are, are three cuts. Uh, we tended to, in the, in the last, before the, we did the last cut, the trees were kind of sort of aging out and we were getting, you can see, they get red in the butt and some of them were, got some wind throw at that point there, which is not a bad thing. It, it, it's, it's a good thing to leave some large woody material on the ground. I've never felt that sweeping the forest floor clean was, was a way to sustainability. So you give up a few. Just to give you an idea of the size of some of these <coughs> trees, uh, my wife is standing right down at the bottom of that big spruce tree there. The biggest one I've cut so far was uh, almost 28 meters. And I, I believe this tree here will be over 30 meters tall when, when I'm hoping to cut that one this year. <laughs> Uh, the second stand type, which would be um, fir, uh, mature, uh, what we did in that there is we did patch cuts. We did some patch cuts 40 feet in diameter, some patch cuts 80 feet in diameter, and we did a few strip cuts in there. So this is the result right now. We, we did this probably in 1985, 87. And again, we've got some, some very nice regeneration of the targeted species we were looking for. And uh, here's another part, another 80-foot hole there. And this is a 40-foot hole. Um, I, we tended to get a little bit better form in the 40s than we did in the 80s, but we still got, and uh, one, one thing to notice, you'll, you'll see some decaying woody matter on, on the ground there. We intentionally, in stands like this, we leave three or four trees, full trees, we cut them down, we just leave them to decompose naturally. They help to feed the whole system of, of the forest. So um, that's what we do in most cases. Um, here's another 40. You can see a tree that we've got marked there. It's got the little red ribbon on it. And with, with hardwood management, it's all about form. It's not how fast it's growing or how big it's growing. It's about the form of the tree, because you're selling logs, you're selling veneer. So you would want to be selling straight trees. That's one tree that will be leaving the stand. If you look at it closely from some different angles, it's got a little bit of a bend in it, and then it's got that queer branch up top coming off. So that's a tree that's, that's going to leave the stand. What we do, too, in uh, crop tree release is, is once we get past the PCT or the pre-commercial thinning stage and we get to trees that are like two inches in diameter or so, um, I choose to girdle rather than to cut them down. It takes about 30 seconds to girdle the tree, and um, it take and there are a number of different um, reasons I like to do it. Uh, number one, if you girdle it, you don't get this coppicing from the stump coming up all the time. By girdling, it takes about three to five years for the tree to to decline and die, and all the leaves to fall off it. So you get kind of a slow release of the surrounding trees. It's not all of a sudden like walking out in a movie theater in a matinee, not being able to see because it's so bright. Well, maybe trees feel the same way. I, I don't know. But I think the natural release is better. I also like it, too, because it, it, one thing I've always worried about is that I'll do this crop tree release, and then I'll get an ice storm, and everything will fall over. This leaves the stand still intact for the next four or five years. So, and also, it's, uh, it's easier. You, instead of walking around with a chainsaw or a bush saw, you can just walk around with a little 10-inch uh, pruning saw and do tree by tree by tree, so a lot more relaxing. The um, third stand type we had was uh, white spruce, balsam fir, a little bit of red maple, 
And then there was an overstory, a very sparse overstory of large yellow birch and, and some fir. Um, what we went in and did was we, we cut out everything. We did sort of what you might call a seed tree. We left those big birches. We left uh, some of the big fir. And then we replanted the entire site with red spruce. We chose red spruce because, number one, it's a tolerant, long-lived tree. And going forward, as far as management, we can handle it in a group and single tree selection type. So you don't have where you grow a forest and then you cut it all down and then you grow another one. You've constantly got a forest growing. You constantly have something you can be taking out. So the, the nice thing is, you'll see, because we left the yellow birch and because we left some of the fir, we now have kind of a mixed wood forest. So it's about 65 or 70% red spruce. There's about 10% yellow birch and about another 20% um, balsam fir. And here's another picture of the stand. You can see the nice straight spruce and maple growing up. You've got a mixed wood stand there. We're in the process now of um, removing the balsam fir. It's now saw walk size, 10 to 12 inches. You can see a tree marked back over there with a little red thing. The reason that one's marked is you can see it's, it's a crooked tree. It'll never make a saw log, so we don't want to keep it in the stand. Uh, here's the stand here, looking through. There's one of the fir that's marked. What we've also done, too, is we've pruned all the trees, starting when they're about two inches in diameter. These trees here are about 15 to 20 centimeters right now. We, we prune them because what we're looking for is quality. There is a market for veneer softwood. That's what they make plywood out of. So, I mean, it's worth considerably more than, than just a regular saw log. Problem is, when you're in a stand, you might only get two or three. Well, there's no one who wants to buy them, but when you have a stand where there's 4,000 of them, then you can fill a truckload every 20 years or however you want to want to operate. The next stand type is a tolerant hardwood stand. What we have is a particular situation on our property, and I've seen it on other properties around, is you have a, <coughs> an understory of, of fir and, and beech in our area. And it, doesn't make any sense to go in and do a group and single tree selection because all you're going to be doing is releasing this fir and this beech. That's what it kind of looks like. So this is right, I'm standing right on the property line, so I'm going to turn 180 degrees. What we do is a complete understory removal before we do our group and single tree selection. Uh, you can see some of the trees that are marked in there. I always go through and mark the trees. You know, it's, it's just easier when I go in and start cutting. So what we're gonna do is open that stand up a little bit, we'll get enough light on the ground, and we'll start getting regeneration of either yellow birch or sugar maple in, in that there. And after about 10 or 15 years, it's, it's hard to see it didn't come out, but we've just got a sea of sugar maple coming up in these stands. So um, that's a good thing in another five or seven years, depending on the density, we might go in there and start doing a, a PCT or pre-commercial thinning. Now, which trees to take and which trees to leave? Like obviously when you're doing a group and single tree selection sort of system, you want to be able to be going in every 20, 25 years and taking out some trees and leaving others behind to grow. Uh, this is a, these little trees are all the same diameter. That's a yellow birch, and that's another yellow birch, and that's another yellow birch. Now, what you have is <coughs> this tree here probably has 10% hardwood. Now, what 
happens in a, in a tree is sapwood is the only part of the tree that's actually functioning. You've got nutrients going up, you've got sugars and starches going down. So the more sapwood you have in a tree, the faster it's going to grow. So this tree here with maximum 20% heart you can, is, um, is certainly growing faster than this one here, which probably has about 50% heartwood in it. This tree here probably has a thin little ring of, of, of sapwood around the outside. That tree is in serious decline. That's the first one you want to cut when you're taking something out of the stand. What we'd have also do too, I suspect that it's probably rotten in the center. So what we would do is we would, it, it's never going to pay its way to the road, so there's no sense in hauling it out. We would cut it down and just leave it to decompose this large woody matter on the ground. Your next choice is, if you have a choice between this one and this one, this is the one that goes. It's not as vigorous, it's not growing as fast as the other one. Uh, the same, I don't have any pictures of maples, but the same kind of holds true. You can, you, can, you can judge the vigor of the tree by its bark. Just like people, you know, when you get old, you, your bark gets a little wooden. <laughs> um, this is uh, some group single tree selection. We made one cut in here um, probably 25 years ago, and you can see we're starting to develop so even aged and diameter classes in that stand, which is, this is what you want to do or what you want to achieve. And you can get this over two or three, um, three cuts. You know, it, one thing when you're into this kind of forestry, you can't be impatient. You know, you will probably never live to see the final results but you got to start somewhere, and you got to start with what you have. So we're, we're really getting close to that now. Um, this is a situation that I've run into uh, a number of times. I've got all this nice regeneration coming up, but yet I've got this one big maple tree there that's shaped like a broccoli, and it's got a crooked stem. Again, it would never pay its way to the side of the road, but if I went to cut it down, it would smash up probably a half a dozen good growing stock around it. So what we've chosen to do in this instance is we girdle that tree. You can see it's, it, it, it falls a lot more softly when it's girdled. You can see we have something. And you've released probably 10 smaller trees around it. Also, if you, if you look closely at it, you can't see it there. It's all full of wing pepper holes, and there's little cavities for birds and other animals to nest in and take advantage of. Uh, right there, that's, uh, that's we're going to be making our, our second cut. And there's a, a nice yellow birch right there. Uh, that yellow birch is almost 50 centimeters in diameter. It's going to make a perfect veneer log, and then two saw logs up above. That's what you eventually want to try to get to in um, this type of forestry. Um, what I've done now is I kind of look at the forest a little differently. I used to look at the forest as it's just a, a bunch of trees growing randomly around. And I, I kind of look at the forest now and, and try to manage it as not being individual trees or anything like that, but be, as being one big organism and all working together. It's almost like ourselves. We consider ourselves one big organism, but inside us are bacteria and all other sorts of things that, that keep us healthy. So what I've been doing now is I'm trying to get six to eight large diameter mature trees. Uh, there's one there. So that's a good tree to leave behind. Uh, we also, what we're trying to do too, is establish six to eight large diameter, I don't like to call them dead wood, I kind of call them brown wood, because when you really go up and look at them, there's nothing dead about them. They're full of incredible amounts of life um, there. 
So we're trying to leave as many of those as possible, or at least six to eight. There's another one you can see up top. There used to be an owl nest up there years ago. Now, if you don't have them, you can make them. And again, here's another example. I've got this big yellow birch. Its form was very poor. You've got all these well-formed sugar maples coming up around it. So that again, we girdled that one there. You release these younger trees and you create habitat uh, for other animals. There's another dead wood there. It's got nice mushrooms growing on it and stuff. Now this is something that I, I came across. To, Candace and I were hiking up on the up, up on the mountain there, and this was a sugar maple that has, of course, fallen into decline. But I kind of think that this is what you would call a, a quilted maple. So I don't know whether it ever would have made a veneer log or something like that. But logs like that, veneer logs, and it could be. It could be a slicer, it could be a rotary, it would probably be a slicer that they do. Those logs go to auction, but you have to kneel what you're, what you're getting. But some of those logs like that would be, would be very valuable. But um, that's about the end of my, that works pretty good. That's about the end of my presentation. If anybody has any questions, um, I'll see, hopefully I might be able to answer them.